I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom, a meeting of the Languages of Wisdom study group with Jerry Northrup, who will be talking about the foundations of his um, uh, relational symmetry paradigm, uh, the spiritual foundations, which include uh, universal consciousness. Uh, I think they include like what it's like to wake up in the morning and start your day. So he'll explain all this. Uh, please, Jerry. Okay. Thank you, Andreas. Um, basically, my view on universal consciousness, uh, if, if we start with the end again, is based on the assumption that uh, organizations of conscious entities uh, are conscious themselves. And I've wrestled with this thought for quite a long time. But if we assume that that's the case, that some organizations, whether it's a family or a community or a government or a global society or what have you, that the organization of conscious entities behaves like a conscious entity itself. And if that were the case, then you can say that the organization of all the organizations of consciousness that would exist anywhere in the universe, that that could be a kind of a universal consciousness. So that may be what what uh, other people will call God. And I'm, I'm comfortable with that idea. It's, it's sort of a hypothesis. I uh, never considered myself to be a religious person at all. Growing up, uh, my family was not particularly religious. My parents thought it would be good for my brother and I to get some uh, religious experience. Uh, we were Boy Scouts in a, in a, um, that was run by a, a the troop was sponsored by the Presbyterian Church, which my parents were sort of members of. Uh, they thought it would be good. So John and I sang in the choir for a number of years when we were in high school, uh, which was fun. And, and I liked that, but that was that was kind of it. Um, the kind of connection with this, uh, you know, everything question and the religious question uh, started to take some real uh, framework for me when I started college. I went to Amherst College in 1960, and they had what they called a core curriculum, which was absolutely fascinating to me, so that everybody in the freshman class took the same courses. Uh, it was a 16-credit hour type of, of situation, so we took two hours of calculus, two hours of physics, two hours of humanities, two hours of a composition course called English 1-2, where you wrote three one-page papers, which you had to type every week for two credit hours, uh, four credit hours of, of a uh, contemporary civilization in the West, and then a language requirement, um, which if you did well enough in high school, you could test out of. Well, I had four years of Latin in uh, high school, and I, I couldn't pass the the criteria, so I ended up taking four years of, or uh, uh, Latin, four hours of uh, Latin in college in my first semester, freshman year, and uh, we studied Catullus, and I had four years of Latin in, in a small rural high school in Western New York, and the Latin I learned there had nothing to do with Catullus. <laughs> Uh, which was, it was really a hoot. I loved it. But I loved the core curriculum. A lot of the students didn't. A lot of the faculty didn't. And they kind of got rid of it five years after the 1969, uh, which I thought was a real shame. But the notion of the core curriculum was that everybody should be reasonably familiar with everything. It's kind of like what Andreas thinks about wanting to know everything. And and I really bought into it. I, I loved it. And I, I particularly loved the writing course, which was all about what you know and how you know it and, and that kind of thing. It, it's been extremely influential in my uh, thinking going forward. So uh, that has persisted. And as I, I did well in science, I liked science uh, when I was in uh, sophomore in, in high school, Sputnik went up and all of a sudden everybody looked at anybody who could do math and physics like you were placed on a fast track and that sort of stuff and I could do math and physics. So that was kind of where it, where it went. I went into science uh, and I, I really liked it. 
I started out, we all, most of us did, and went to Amherst at that point, seemed to be starting as physics majors, and then we branched out. I hit biology and said, wow, nobody knows what's going on in biology, so I switched over to biology. Uh, but I continue to take a lot of math and physics in addition to, you know, philosophy, religion, um, Asian history, economics, um, all of those kinds of things, English literature, the silver poets and, and stuff. You, you had that kind of distribution requirements. Everybody had to take biology and chemistry in their sophomore year as part of it, as well as an American studies course. Anyway, so this this notion of the, of the whole man, and Amherst was um, all men at that point, uh, which was gradually starting to change, but it, it was uh, part, of, part of the education there was, was that and that transition. Uh, but moving on into, into science, and then I hit the point where from that perspective, uh, when I went through graduate school and then uh, did a, a postdoc to that, where I began to, to feel that science was uh, kind of compartmentalized and it didn't really speak to the overall experiences which I was having emotionally and what have you. So in 1969, the end of my postdoc at, at uh, University of California, Davis, I essentially dropped out and Moved back to New York, I moved in with Lynn, and, and you know, we've been together ever since. And I started to write, and um, I had taken points at topology in the graduate school, so I liked that foundation. I proposed a an eight-dimensional universe, which was the four dimensions of physics, and then four dimensions of a non-metric space, which dealt with language, a language creator and symbols and that sort of stuff. And I wrote a paper. I wrote a bunch of papers that I submitted in various journals and none of them got accepted. I thought they would because I'd been published in science before, which was, you know, a high prestige kind of thing. But I, I continued to write and eventually um, we moved up to Western New York. I started working at the uh, Center for Theoretical Biology. Lynn was at uh, Fisher Price. Um, and, and it moved forward, but as I kept my hand in with the with the science, uh, because I worked with microbial genetics in graduate school, I started doing microbial tank farms, fermenting weeds, growing microbes and what have you, but working on the foundations of, of science and uh, relational systems theory, maximum entropy at the Center for Theoretical Biology. So that moved forward, but uh, more and more, I became interested in, in what, how, how, if you're going to leave science, what are you going to replace it with? In the 1970, shortly after I dropped out, we were living in a little one room cabin up uh, north of Toronto. Um, and uh, I had this huge epiphany that what science, what physics was missing was language. And that's why I, I went back and wrote wrote the papers and started. So in in, uh, in the 1980s, I started inventing languages to try and see if, if that could provide some way to bridge, because I felt that any kind of replacement for science that you were going to have was going to have to be able to explain what kind of science can explain. Uh, so that, that if you wanted to say, well, physics isn't right, you say, okay, how can you explain physics and explain where you think it's it's not right? But you have to be able to explain the successes that it has, which are enormous. And, and I always loved it. Same kind of thing in biology, all the stuff that was known, you had to explain that. So I started working with, with inventing languages as a way to provide a framework of thinking as to how I would would proceed, and it was it was guided by this notion of a core curriculum. You had to include all aspects of knowledge. So, like when I was a freshman, I was studying um, Greek tragedies as well as as physics and calculus, and, and it was all rolled together. Uh, so, I ended up eventually inventing some fourteen different languages. 
and all this is on the, the birds to try and, and build some kind of comprehension view. And it comes back to how do you start and, and how do you go? And what I like to do is to how this sort of evolved by the end of 2002, I settled on one language, which I am now calling Odo but it is a way of setting up a framework as to how you incorporate everything into a belief of consciousness. So uh, I'm going to explain, I'm going to try and share a screen here. So I set up a language by starting out with what is the most fundamental thing you can think of? And it becomes a point, and then a line, and then a T, and, and connecting the lines. And that became the foundation that emerged out of the radiation systems theory work at, at uh, UB with John Ray. Uh, and then reflect these in the context of a, of a distinction. If these are fundamental concepts in and of themselves, what happens when you, you then make a distinction between these and other things? So there was the notion of, of the distinction itself and then crossing a distinction, symbolizing that and then interrelating all of that, and then combining these so that this became the notion of consciousness, a point existence in the universe, which has a boundary between that point existence and the rest of the universe, and that became the universe itself. And then developed uh, a linear connection of that point internal to the boundary, which became the notion of will or hunger, desire. You expanded that with the next one, and that became emotion. Then it came over here, it becomes belief and memory. And then that expanded on when you have the boundary, you can cross the boundary. Then the notion of having a body for the point consciousness. And then what could the body do, action? What could the body do in terms of sensation, of, of detecting the action? And how does that interrelate that in, in terms of creating things? And then a, a, a level that became, one of the things we create is language. So the language has a sign. The sign has a definition related to other signs. The sign can be associated with a picture or a diagram or an image. And then all can all be combined into forming an idea. And ideas are always identified with an idea creator back to this point. Then you take the idea creator, and as it goes out pretty quick, you lose the identification of you see other ideas that are created. You don't necessarily know who created them. And so it's back to the notion of a of a thing. And a thing is an idea that is related to a creator and it it appears to be a real thing in the universe. And things relate to things. This is the oneness, twoness, threeness, fourness, or foursome. Uh, things relate to each other. And this this is, in my sense, is a, a, a thing that's related to two other things that are related to each other. When Andreas looks at this as a cycle, and I see that in, in similar terms, and then the fourness is that. But the, the advantage of I set all this up and then I mapped it into the Roman alphabet. So I said that the point was going to be U. And I picked the line as I, this one as E, because it looked like an E. And then the A is sort of like this. An H would be better. The first language I did was O-I-T-H um, as, as being the letters. But the O was already symbolize the boundary and so that didn't work so I ended up using that for the the second set of things and chose you for the letter here the notion was that the structure of the letters represented in some sense the little diagrams and the concepts of the derivation of archetypal meaning that I set up over on the left hand side so what this allowed me now is that I can say this so in terms of who I am as a consciousness, it's Uiea, Owayaha, Duparubu, Chulutuku, Sugufushu, Dubuuzu. So when I wake up in the morning, it takes me about 10 seconds to go through the overall framework of what 
I think I am as a consciousness. And so given that is as a framework then as to where you start, then the notion is how does that interrelate to everybody else and what they do and how does this become uh, the notion of reality outside of myself, my framework, which is based on consciousness and how do I communicate with a language? How do I translate between my language and their language? And the sense that if we do that successfully, that concept of covariance, then you're back to this notion of how does that expand? And eventually you say it expands to the universe. I mean, why not? It's the simplest explanation. And it leads to this concept then of a universal consciousness in a hypothetical universal language. And then we're, we're back to this notion of, of what is God? Is God a universal consciousness where we are all aware of each other, which is the consciousness is aware of each of us? And we have different kinds of relationships that we develop with our concepts as to what, um, what is it all about? How does it start? We wake up each day as a conscious entity, and then it is, it's a question of, okay, who we are, what are where are we, you know, who are we talking to? How does it to relate to, we have all these memories. How does that uh, fit into this notion of who I am today? And how do I interact with other people? And how do I interact with the universe? And does it all make sense? And this kind of structure, and this mantra, <clears throat> it's kind of like, uh, like a chant. Uwaiye, Owayaha, Duparubu, Chulatuku, Sungafushu, Numawuzu. I have um, done a brief summary of my whole worldview of, of the foundation from it in terms of archetypal concepts. And that is the basis then of, you know, I do that. And then it's, I used to do it all the time. Now I, I don't formally do it, but it's always there. And that sort of sets the framework from how you interact with others, but also with everything, everything in the universe. Um, it all comes back to, to that kind of thing. And is that a religious experience? Is that a, a religious thing? Is that just uh, my own peculiarity? We, who knows? Um, mm -hmm. But I find that this, this can be translated into real things that work, like the timberfish technology which is very much imbued with this. And I've, I've always joked in the past that we could write the programs that run the timberfish technology in Autodoop. Then it leads to the notion of, do you believe in artificial intelligence, which I think is an oxymoron, but how do we counter oxy, uh, artificial intelligence by connecting it to a soul, to consciousness? So to this emotion? is... Um... This is uh, absolutely beautiful, and this helps me uh, really understand you much better. Uh, <laughs> you know, we'll be sharing this. And so maybe just to conclude with this prayer, maybe we could say this together. Uh, the How do you say it? Uh, ooh. Yeah, uh, uh, the, the pronunciations there, I start with the vowels, and then go to... We have like 10 seconds, I think. Expressed with you after, so it's ooh, I, E, A. a. That's the first quaternion in a certain sense. And then... O Uyea Owayaha Duparubu Chulatuku Sungafushu Numawuzu Uyea Owayaha Duparubu Chulatuku Sungafushu Numawuzu Uyea Owayaha Duparubu Chulatuku Sungafushu Numawuzu Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm a Patreon supporter for Math for Wisdom because Andres 
and I have been friends for a long time, most of our lives. And the conversations I've had with him over the years have been very useful for me. Uh, he's also a big, big fan, my supporter, you know, of my work. And um, we just we have deep conversations about math and physics that have been useful for charting the course of my interests. And you know, I'm just I'm grateful, and you know, I I want to support that, and you know, our weekly or bi you know semi weekly or bi weekly conversations have been have been um, very important for me in the last couple of years, especially. So yeah, that's why I'm a supporter.